Awesome. Thank you, Jeff. So today I'd like to talk to everyone about what it could be like to develop C and C++ and what I consider to be a much more modern development environment. Uh, if you do like this talk, definitely check out the links to uh, the two blog posts that I wrote on this topic as well. They dive into some different aspects as well as technical details of how to set up a project like this. So let's start by all getting on the same page on what I mean when I say development environment. I'm talking about all of the tools that a developer uses on her local machine while writing code, while implementing feature tickets, bug fixes, etc. So of course that's her editor and her build system, compiler, debugger, testing, coverage, um, static analysis, dynamic analysis, what, all of those things that she's using locally. And more importantly, let's talk about what makes it modern. First and foremost, we need to have easy integration of all of our tools with our IDE, but we should not be tightly coupling our tools to a specific IDE. As much as I think I know what the best IDE is, you might disagree, and I shouldn't uh, force my opinions on you. So we need to make sure that the tools allow for different editors. We should have declarative dependency management. Coming from a Java, a Python, Node.js world, this might seem obvious. Uh, if you haven't done C++ ever, or maybe in a long time, you might have forgotten that dependencies are horrible in this world. And it would be really nice if we didn't have to download source code and compile it manually and then mess with link flags. And it, it should just work if it's going to be modern, by my definition. We should, of course, have a unit testing framework and a mocking library to go along with that. Code coverage reports, uh, analysis, both static and dynamic, to help us find uh, code smells and memory leaks and other forms of issues. And, of course, we need a debugger. Uh, seems pretty basic at this point, but that's another thing that the C and C++ world has lacked for a long time, is a, a good debugging UI like that, which JetBrains provides. And it should be implied that all of these tools, if it's going to be on my recommended list, it needs to be actively maintained and have good community support. We need to have a backlog of questions, Q&A, online that we can search for, and we need to have an active community that's available to respond to new questions that I might not be able to find uh, via Google. So how do we get there? Specifically with two new tools over the last decade, JetBrains came out with a dedicated C and C++ IDE called CLion. It's fantastic if you've done any other JetBrains IDEs, CLion will be very familiar and you'll love it. And then Conan comes in to solve the problem of dependency management. I'm gonna go in depth with both of these tools. They're really fantastic and they really bring together what I consider to be a modern environment. They're certainly not the only options. Uh, certainly CLion is not the only option. You could use other IDEs and editors if you wanted, but it is one I uh, would personally recommend. There are also alternatives to Conan, which we're not going to talk about. I have done some investigation. Conan is my recommended tool, but if for whatever reason it doesn't fit your needs, know that there are alternatives you could investigate as well. And we're going to combine these two relatively newcomers to the world with uh, a bunch of well-established tools. We've got CMake in there as our build system. This is the glue that's going to hold everything together. Uh, this really does rely a lot on CMake. You could do all of this with another build system, but you'd be redoing a lot of the work that I'm going to walk through in the demos. Google Test is a fantastic unit testing library. Uh, we're not going to talk in detail about it, but it does also come with Google Mock Mocking Library. You could swap that out for other uh, mocking libraries if you wanted to do uh, a mix and match your testing library and your mocking library. Compiler, uh, I'm going to demonstrate with GCC, but this all works just as well with the LVM toolset or Microsoft. Uh, I, th I think it works with Microsoft. I don't know anything about Microsoft. We've got Clang Tidy and Clang Format coming in for our stack static analysis and code formatting. I won't be demonstrating cl Clang Format specifically, but I do recommend you include that in your own projects. And then, of course, we've got Valgrind, tried and true. 
So let's all get on board and make sure we have some basic understandings of what CMake is and how it works. And if you want to learn more in depth about how to use CMake in your own projects, definitely check out my Learn CMake course. Uh, it's not fully fleshed out, but you'll learn a lot of the basics uh, with some, some both labs and slides. At its core, CMake is a makefile generator. It does not invoke the compiler directly. It simply generates make files. It does support a bunch of different makefile syntaxes, including GNU Make, of course, as well as Ninja, Microsoft's uh, NMake, and I think there's some others in there as well. So CMake is just generating the make files, and then you uh, switch over to your preferred make tool to actually invoke the compiler. It does have a unit test runner. This is not the same thing as your assertion library like Google Test or JUnit. This is much more akin to Maven's Surefire plugin. So this is just collecting all of the tests and running them and telling you which tests, which you know, test suites per se passed or failed and not necessarily test case by case. And then it also has a software packaging orchestrator, which I will definitely talk about um, a little bit more. The biggest reason I picked CMake <laughs> is back in 2014 when CLion was announced, uh, JetBrains said that they were going to support one and only one build system, and that was CMake. So I thought it was a good time to learn CMake. Uh, since then, I have learned it really is a top-notch uh, build tool, at least in the C and C++ world, and is cross-platform. That's got to be around for any modern environment. Uh, a lot of times you're building Linux applications in the C and C++ world, but for any large enterprise, us developers are usually forced onto Windows, so we need our build system to work on both. It should be high level. We shouldn't have to be dealing with specific object files and telling it where header files are and whatnot. It should understand concepts of this is an executable and this is a source file, and the build system should know how to make that happen. I shouldn't need to define every little rule of how to build a C++ application. And it should do more than just compiling. I want it to have built-in support for unit testing, that uh, unit test runner. I want it to have the ability to do packaging. I, I want it to be able to say, hey, um, I need a deb package, I need an RPM package, I need a D package for Mac OS, and it should just be able to build those. And of course, it should have IDE integration. Not just do I expect my IDE to work with the tool, but it would be really cool if the tool can work with other editors that pre-existed CMake, or maybe just weren't built specifically for CMake. Um, so in that sense, Eclipse doesn't directly parse CMake files, but CMake can actually generate the Eclipse metadata. If that's the IDE you want to use, you can do CMake-G Eclipse make files, and it will generate the dot settings folder and the dot C project file so that you are ready to start developing with Eclipse and Eclipse knows about all of your include directories, etc. So some really cool features that make CMake stand out relative to some of the older and even some of the newer build systems. Uh, one of the most important things here is transitive dependencies. So if you have library A and it depends on B and B depends on C, it's really, really cool that CMake actually includes the uh, the, the include directory on the compilation line for libc when you are building lib a because it understands that full transitive path um, and you don't have to explicitly say hey even though um, I, i'm not directly linking a against c there's that transitive path and all of the include folders from libc will also go into lib a we have library and package discovery that really uh, is more useful because of the transitive dependencies, so I can just link against Google Test. I, I can say, hey, I need Google Test. I can tell CMake that, and CMake will go find the Google Test package with all of the targets and header files and transitive requirements and make those all available to anything that I say my project uses Google Test with. 
has componentized installation and packaging that's all built in so you can say hey this is my dev component it has my header files and my static library and this is my non-dev right just the, the production package and it has my executable or my shared library or whatever so that components is, is really nice to have as a built-in feature there we've got support for custom and customized compiler and compiler settings so it's very easy if you need to use some highly custom tool chain whether that is your own compiler built from the ground up or just a fork of gcc if you want to use custom compiler settings all of that is very easy but it also still has same defaults and then we've got easy to read color coded messages. This is a big step up from, for instance, auto tools where your compiler warnings and errors can really hide in a, a large mess of text. So the fact that CMake is not echoing command line, uh, sorry, compilation commands by default, and the fact that what it does print is color coded, it really helps make those warnings and errors stand out when you're trying to parse a very long log file. And it's a scripting file. Uh, the, the CMake configuration is writ with a, written with a scripting language. It's a very simple syntax, um, so it's pretty quick to learn. And with that scripting language, you can do just about anything you would want if it, if it isn't built in. So a real quick example, uh, this isn't the live example that I'm going to show in a moment, but this at least gives us an idea of what it's like to work with the CMake project. So we define our project name at the top, and then this first block of code is defining a library and configuring it to be installed in an appropriate directory. So we say our library CMake demo lib contains one source file, that's fine. And then the next target include directories. This configures uh, what directories should be included with the dash i on the command line for header files and we've got some generator syntax here which is a relatively complex concept but it's also really cool that it allows us to say this is the include path that i want to be used when i'm building this project and then the next one install interface that's the include path that should be used by other people who use this library as a dependency uh, so we can define both of these right here and then it just works when someone imports CMake demo into their own project. Uh, without this generator concept, you end up with your full source, um, the, the path to your source code in their build system which of course is not desirable. Got a couple install lines that just configures where to install the library and where to install its include direct or header files uh, in the installation path, you know, relative directories. Next block, we of course build an executable, one source file again, we say that this executable depends on our library, and then we configure where this executable is going to be installed relative to the installation directory. And then finally, we have one more line, which uh, is all that's necessary to auto-generate that CMake import script, which makes it, again, really easy for other projects to import CMake demo. Okay, so I've started up a Docker image here, and I've done the bare minimum. I want you guys to see what it really looks like to build out a CMake project from the ground up. I haven't even cloned the project yet. So we have our build system and the bare minimum tools, our make and our compiler. And I have downloaded, compiled, and installed Google Test. Uh, that is one, one of the libraries that this project is going to use. So the first thing we'll do is go ahead and clone the demo project. And once it's cloned, I'm going to create a build directory inside the source code. CMake does do an out of source build. So we're not mixing up our, um, we're not mixing up our build objects with our source code. And here we can see the actual CMake command, nice and simple, and it runs very quickly. We can see that CMake has discovered GCC version 9.3.0 on our system. 
and it also found things like pthread and uh, it didn't echo anything about finding google test but it certainly would have erred had it not found google test so we can safely assume that it was able to find google test based on our cmake configuration file once CMake has been executed, there is now a bunch of make files and other stuff in this build directory. And we can just use make like we normally would with, uh, you know, 20 years ago to build our project. So it's make dash J9. And here we can see the very nicely color coded output. Uh, it's very easy to see, hey, there's our library getting built. There's uh, the binary and some unit tests. And once that's built, we can use CMake's built-in ctest program to execute all of the unit tests in the project. So that output gets very nicely uh, printed. This is not Google test output. This is specifically ctest output. If any of the tests had failed, we would see the full Google test output uh, showing which test cases failed in each executable. And then I want to show off uh, what it's like to actually create those packages that I was talking about. So in this project, I've uh, enabled both TGZ and zip packages, and it is smart enough to take everything that was in, in the installation directory and just zip it up, tar it up. Uh, it's very simple to also include support for .debs, so you don't have to learn how to write your own control files, your own RPM specs, your own I don't know what the, uh, the verbiage is for Windows binary uh, installers, but it has support for that too. So you can just say, hey, here's all my programs, um, here's all my libraries, here's the relative directories I want it to go in. And then CMake knows how to build all these different installable packages, which has uh, been a real lifesaver for me trying to support other people on different systems that I don't use on a daily basis. And then, of course, like any make build system, we have an install target. So I went ahead and set dester so it gets installed to a local directory. And we can see with tree package, um, I, I did dester equals package. So under there, we can see it went to USR local, and then we have our binary, our include directories, the shared library down there. And then this is our automatically generated CMake scripts so that other people can uh, pull in CMake demo. Okay, now that we're on the same baseline for uh, CMake, let's talk about the first newcomer here, Conan. First, we need to talk about why previous tools existed, why they weren't really sufficient. One of the most common ways that people solve dependencies in C and C++ world was by just using their system installed package manager like apt or yum. This wasn't great for one of the big obvious reasons being that it wasn't cross-platform. It did not help you manage your dependencies if you were working on a Windows system. Uh, your only option at that point was to do remote development. It also had the big limitation of not allowing you to have more than one version of a library installed on your system at any given point in time. If you have a legacy version of a project using OpenSSL 0.9, and now you're trying to develop a new version of it with OpenSSL 1. whatever, you were largely SOL if you were previously reliant on your system package manager. Uh, yes, I hear you NixOS people. That is one solution. Um, it, and it might even be a good one, but it's not the one I went down. There's also the requirement of having root access to do apt and yum the way they're meant to be done anyway. There's workarounds for that, but in general, you would need root access. And though it's really nice to have that, we all know that in the enterprise world, you don't often get it. And the limited developer features available in those system package managers. So, you know, for instance, I'm trying to build uh, my package, and my package uh, says it needs all of these dependencies. With uh, apt and, and, and RPM, for instance, you would have to actually try and build that package in order to install those dependencies. There's no just, hey, please install the dev dependencies for me. So. Basics of how Conan works comes down to recipes and profiles, 
and uh, that's how we're going to build packages with those two concepts. And then once we have our packages built, we're going to share them to an artifact repository and other people will download them from the artifact repository and cache them locally. Very, very similar to the way Maven does its artifacts. So let's talk about recipes and profiles. Recipes are where we describe all of the dependencies, both uh, build time and runtime. It has separate concepts for those, as well as all of the instructions for building the package. So, yeah, building your package and then also uh, taking the installable files and packaging them up for shareable use. Recipes also define metadata. So that defines your library names, what the include directories are for each library, if there's any compiler flags that need to be added by dependence, um, preprocessor macros that need to be defined, all of that can get included in the metadata. And that can get defined very as granular as you'd like for your project. That metadata then gets pulled into other dependents when they use your library, and that metadata will get passed into build systems. So if my spaghetti recipe you know, declared that the plate should be round, that roundness would be passed into the build system um, for the next person in line, and that that's uh, really key in that Conan is not trying to reproduce a build system. It is simply trying to work with whatever build system you have. If there are other package managers out there for C and C++ world that are tightly coupled to a specific build system, and I don't think that is a recommendable approach because I don't want to have to rewrite the build system for OpenSSL. That sounds miserable. I would much rather just wrap OpenSSL with its existing build system and Conan and then be able to use it. So that is the way Conan works. It does imply sometimes a little bit of duplication in logic. You know, uh, If you want to support people both with and without Conan, then you're going to need to define all of this metadata in your CMake project, and then you're going to have to define it all again in Conan. In my experience, that hasn't been all that much extra work, and it does give you a lot of extra features, uh, support for other people doing other things. Profiles then describe a system. Profiles describe your classic triplet, so the build system, the host system, and what target you're working with. You can add environment variables in there. You say what your build type is, what your compiler version is, what your compiler ABI is. All of that stuff goes into a profile. You can have more than one profile defined on your system, which is how you would do cross compilation or debug and release, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So you combine a recipe with a profile and you have a unique way to build uh, a package. So once you've built your package, you can then share it to Conan, uh, to, to a Conan server. JFrog provides a public Conan server called uh, Conan Center. It's very analogous to repo.maven.apache.org, and that is very easy for you to just publish your own packages to and uh, download lots of public ones. If you need to do this for your own private company, the, there is a version of Artifactory that comes with Conan support, and it is actually free. It's wonderful. And if you're just trying to do some little testing by yourself, it's not worth standing up your own Artifactory edition or uh, instance yet. You can just use the Conan server executable that comes shipped with every installation of Conan. Artifacts uploaded to a Conan server must include the recipe. That's just a uh, fact of uploading to a Conan server, and they must include instructions for building from source. Sometimes that means they include the source uh, directly. Sometimes that just means they reference a git URL in the git hash or SVN or whatever you want. Optionally, you can also include one or more binaries. 
Importantly, this means that if you build your project on Linux 64-bit with GCC and release flags, and I want to go download that, but I need the debugging symbols because the recipe and instructions for the source must be included, I can download that recipe. Conan will recognize, hey, I'm trying to build that with flags that don't match the one and only uploaded binary, and it will recompile it with my flags on my machine for use. And that just happens automatically as part of Conan install. A lot of the stuff that's on Conan Center has lots of different binaries pre-compiled, so a lot of times you don't need to actually rebuild for, for different uh, profiles. But the fact that this is a built-in feature that you must include the recipe and you must include the source makes this really easy to use in a cross-platform way. So once you've picked your artifact, you've downloaded it, it gets cached into your home directory, and this is very analogous, again, to Maven. Unlike Node, where artifacts then get copied into your project directory, and Conan artifacts remain in one place, they do not get duplicated all across your system, and then when Conan uh, passes this information to the build system, it tells your build system, hey, this is located at home slash David slash dot conan slash dot data and it passes all of the directories to your dependencies in the centralized conan cache on your computer artifacts are also uniquely named this is really important not only is it going to uniquely name based on package name and version it's going to uniquely uh, name the folders based on the host and the target and everything that was in the profile and some stuff that wasn't even in your profile. So you can have lots of different artifacts, different revisions with all the same profile settings. Uh, so you, you never have to worry about, um, oh, this worked on mine, this didn't work on his. I can't tell why they're using the same artifact. Well, they wouldn't be. You would be able to look at the exact uh, artifact ID and see that there is some little difference here and then you'd be able to pinpoint what that difference is and understand why it's failing on one person's machine and not another. Okay, so here we have a very, very simple uh, Conan recipe. We define a name and a version and then the uh, settings line is defining which pieces of your profile are applicable to this recipe. Your profile might define more settings than these four, but these are the four that must be defined in order to build the spaghetti package. Options could be defined in a profile, but usually are not. Uh, usually options are going to be defined on the command line or in uh, a recipe as well. And with options, we have the ability to set defaults too. Generators is how we tell Conan what our build system is and how we want to integrate Conan into our build system. So it has a bunch of different ways to integrate with CMake. My favorite way is with its find package feature. So I'm saying, hey, Conan, I want you to take all of my dependencies and I want you to write for me some CMake find package scripts. Uh, that's very similar to the generated files we saw just a minute ago in the CMake demo. So it's going to go ahead and generate me at least three uh, find package scripts, one for stockpot, gtest, and plates. And then if any of those had transitive dependencies, it would build out uh, find package scripts for them as well. A CM line, this allows Conan to uh, understand where our source code is and understand what revision is being used every time I create a package in a Conan server without me having to copy and paste a git hash every time. In the build method, we are doing a very simple way of saying, hey, Conan, this is a CMake project. First, you're going to run CMake configure, and then you're going to run make, and then you're going to run ctest. Uh, this is four statements on one line just to do, save some space, but that's all it is. And that's very boilerplate. If you're doing a CMake project, your build function is going to look just like that. Package is where we're just going to use CMake's uh, default install target and use that. And this uh, CMake self that comes provided by Conan, and it sets a bunch of uh, sane defaults so that when you invoke the install target, it gets installed to an appropriate directory for Conan. 
Okay, just like with CMake, I have started up a new Docker instance. I have not done any configuration for Conan. Literally, all I've done is install CMake and a compiler and Conan via Python's uh, package manager, pip. So the first thing that's going to happen in this demo is I'm going to go ahead and get Conan configured on this new machine. We do that with Conan profile new, and it can uh, detect the system. We do get a little warning here. That's just because Kona is working really hard to stay backwards compatible, and they're still on version one. They made a choice early on in development, and they're warning you, hey, that was a dumb choice. Please fix it with this. But they don't want to break uh, backwards compatibility, so they're not going to force you into that. I'll go ahead and take that suggestion. And then we'll go ahead and clone the project. CD into the project. I'm going to create two different build directories this time, one where we're only going to use Conan and one where we're going to use both Conan and CMake. So the first thing I'm going to do once I'm in the Conan build directory is run Conan install. That's going to download all of the dependencies, again, transitively, that are necessary to build this project, and then generate a bunch of uh, CMake scripts necessary for CMake to do its job. All of these download pretty quick. I am running this locally on my machine, and that is downloading from Conan's uh, Conan Central server. We can see in this output that it has uh, generated these, you know, find gtest, find docs, and find speed log uh, scripts. And after this, I'm going to run Conan build. So this is just a wrapper around that build method. So it's going to sequentially run CMake and then make and then ctest for me. You don't have to run ctest as part of your build, but it does make sense from a package management perspective that we shouldn't pass the build without running ctest. If you want the finer granularity, then you need to uh, step directly into, uh, you know, the bypass Conan and go directly to your build system, and you'll see that momentarily. So next up is Conan build. It's generated CMake, now it's building, and then it automatically ran ctest after that. We can run Conan package and see right away that it has installed to our local directory in a directory named uh, package, and then there's everything. We'll see it with a tree as well. And this should look very similar to the CMake demo. So we have our binary, we have um, a little bit of Conan stuff. So Conan manifest that tells Conan what files are supposed to be in this package, helps it do uh, SHA hashes and whatnot to make sure that when someone else downloads this, they get the same contents. I've also included a license file in here. And uh, this time we're building with static libraries just because that seems to be the, the Conan convention is by default you do static but you could certainly have set the default to be shared. And next I'm going to go ahead and do a Conan create. So this is going to show us what it's like to try and recreate this package in a shareable fashion. So this is going to do this in a new sanitized environment where it runs through the whole process and puts this in to, uh, let's see, do we see it? Here we go. This has put it into my Conan cache. So dot Conan slash data. And there it is, Conan demo version number, uh, my name. So that's the author of the package. And then the channel that I'm trying to publish this to. So I'm going to say it's going to be published to the stable channel. Uh, there's no convention necessarily on how you name your channels. But common way that I've done it in the past is I've got a stable channel and a test channel or stable and develop, something like that. And then this big long hash uh, references all of the profile settings and options that were chosen at the time that I built this. Once that is in my local cache, I could choose to do a Conan upload and share this to Conan Center or my own private uh, uh, artifact repository. And it's also now usable by other packages on my system. You know, if I am coordinating both a uh, 
library and an executable. I would need to do Conan create first to put it in my local cache, just like with a Maven install, so that I can then test it with my executable over here. And that would be a great use case for a different channel named perhaps testing. So you don't, so you never accidentally publish your locally compiled stuff to the stable channel. Uh, one thing I did in the past was I would set my permissions in the artifact repository to only allow pushes to the stable channel from a CI server. So no one could ever accidentally publish from their personal computers to the stable channel. One really thing, cool thing that gets got glanced over here is this test package. So this is a built-in feature of Conan. You can include a test package folder in your uh, repository. And then whenever you invoke Conan create, it's going to then use test package as a test for your entire package. This isn't at the unit test level. This is to make sure that your Conan recipe works correctly, that your metadata is defined appropriately such that a user of your package can correctly import it, link against it, run it, etc. So inside that test package is another Conan recipe with another CMake project, and it is dependent on the Conan demo package. And if that doesn't pass its own unit tests, the whole Conan create fails and says, hey, your package isn't ready to be shared yet. This has caught a lot of problems, especially early on when I was still learning how to use Conan. I thought I'd written it correctly. I could build my package. I could install my package. But it turns out I hadn't written all the metadata correctly and users weren't able to actually consume my package. And I needed to include a test package in here to work through those errors first. So after that, we'll go ahead and switch into the CMake build directory, where again, I'll run Conan install, which finishes instantaneously because all of those binaries were already downloaded locally. And then I'm going to use CMake this time to generate the make files instead of letting Conan do it for me. I'm going to add dash D CMake build type equals release just to make sure that my CMake configuration matches the Conan configuration. Uh, in a previous example, in the CMake example, I didn't bother because there was no Conan to match and I could just take whatever CMake set as a default. This is, of course, going to run very quick. Uh, but it does the same thing. We can see that CMake has found uh, gtest this time in the Conan cache directory, and all of the other libraries are, are doing the same thing. We can follow that up with a simple make command again. And ctest, just like before, executes our unit tests. Make package still works just like it did before and uh, make install with dester also works just like it did before. I think this is a really important concept to show that you can use Conan without having to change your pre-existing CMake workflow. This was really critical when I first uh, started introducing Conan at uh, a job that I was in. No one was really sure that we wanted to go down this route of Conan. It was very new. Uh, I mean, it, it had only been out for a year or so at the time that I introduced it at my company. And we weren't sure we were going to like it. So we wanted to make sure that we could keep doing dependency management the way we had done, which I won't get into. It was messy. It was not as good as Conan. But we needed to be able to make sure we could keep doing it that way. And we also didn't want everyone to have to learn all the ins and outs of Conan. So to be able to create a package that works equally well simultaneously with or without Conan was really important, and Conan lets us do that. OK, let's look at the shiny stuff, Sea Lion. Um, Conan did the heavy lifting with package management, but Sea Lion then makes our development a joy in the way that uh, JetBrains always does. So it is built for modern CMake. Like I mentioned, when it first came out, CMake was the only thing it supported. It does now support other build systems, uh, but CMake still has first class support in there. Uh, it does, C line does parse your CMake files directly. It is not like CMake needs to generate any extra metadata like it would for Eclipse. 
CLion also recognizes that different targets in your project, different files, different directories, have their own include directories in their own preprocessor definitions, their own compiler flag, maybe their own language level, different settings entirely. And so CLion has recognizes that there are different contexts. You might even have different contexts for the same file because you might have a release context and a debug context. And each of these different contexts will define different preprocessor definitions. And you can switch between these contexts. You can see which context you're in at any given point in time. And you get different syntax highlighting, different collapsed states, all of that stuff. Uh, that, to me, is a huge win, at least at the time that I was doing this uh, investigation a couple of years ago. Eclipse still did not support the concept of one project with different sets of include directories. Seemed really basic for a C++ project, but Eclipse just did not support that. It will also, uh, CLion will automatically create run configurations for you based on every target in your CMake project. And if it recognizes that a target is linked against any one of a number of different unit test libraries, it'll create a special run configuration for that unit test framework so that you get the nicely parsed output that we're all used to in a JetBrains IDE. Almost everything I'm going to show you and talk about with CLion is first party and built in, but there is a little bit of uh, third partiness with Conan. So the, the Conan folks did create a plugin. It's okay, gets the job done most of the time, uh, but it is third party. We have some more features that really make CLion stand out, and one of the big ones here is toolchain support. So if you are working on Windows again, you're that enterprise guy who doesn't have access to a Linux server, but you're compiling Linux software, maybe you only have access to Docker or you only have access to Wizzle, in which case CLion still works seamlessly if your toolchain resides in that wheelhouse. You can still clone your project locally on your Windows machine, not even in Wizzle, just on your Windows host. And then you can say, my tool chain is in Docker, or my tool chain is in this Wizzle instance. And it'll do all of the uh, you know, volume mounting and, and whatnot, all the magic, to make that tool chain work with your files. Same thing for a remote server. You can clone your code locally and say, hey, I have an SSH able server over here. It has all of my tools installed, all my uh, libraries. You would have to deal with Conan remotely, uh, you know, Conan separately, and I'll show that. You just give it the SSH credentials, and then it automatically copies the files up, copies them back down, copies everything over to do static analysis, and, and I'll show all that. It's really cool how seamless the multi-tool chain support is. And you can define multiple tool chains in the same project and run them all simultaneously as well. It does have integration with Clang Tidy. Uh, it's not just integration, it's built in. It ships with its own Clang Tidy executable and most of its static analysis rules, if not all, at least most, are actually just Clang Tidy uh, that it's wrapping. It has Clang Format support as well. So if you have a .clang format file in your project and you click save, you can, if you want to, have it automatically run Clang Format or you know, when you do auto format, you can just uh, forward that to claim format as well. Like every JetBrains IDE, it has a fantastic debugger. They've made a few extra things in there for C and C++, like they, you can ask for a hex view of any random integer, not just addresses. And you can also get a memory view of data in RAM, so you want to dig into pointers and whatnot, you can actually go look at the memory table. There's built-in support for parsing Valgrind output. Those horribly difficult to read Valgrind stack traces get nicely parsed and you can click on each frame and see the preview of what code that uh, frame is pointing to. And I'll show that in a demo. Core dumps are really easy to manage. You just point a C line at a core dump, it'll open it, parse the stack frame, do everything you hope for. And then remote GDP is support. Of course, that's a, a necessary thing for dealing with remote tool chains as well. And I'll show that it's very seamless. Okay, let's take a quick look at a simple CLIN demo. 
I have cloned this project already. I'm just going to open it. There's no uh, ID metadata already in here. I have not um, executed Conan. I do, the Conan install step you're gonna see runs very quickly because I've already downloaded all the binaries. I forgot to clear my Conan cache before running this, but we'll see that. So right away, it asks me to define some tool chains. So I'm going to define a release tool chain, and it's going, or not a, re, uh, a release profile. And then I need to tell it, hey, Conan, the release profile in CMake, I would like you to pair up with the release, I'm sorry, the default Conan profile. Once that's defined, the Conan plugin will automatically run Conan install every time CLion runs CMake. So we can see there's my Conan install command and there's my CMake command. This CMake pane is part of CLion and this is where we can always see uh, all of the CMake output. We can see the same output we saw in the Conan demo where it's printing out um, all of the libraries that it found again in the Conan cache. We can also see the exact CMake line that it executed. So it's apparently using the code blocks Unix make files generator and we can see the dash S is pointing to our source directory, etc, cetera, etc. Cetera. So with that, let's go ahead and see what it is to run a unit test. We can see all of the automatically generated run configurations based on the targets in this project. Uh, we have our standard unit test uh, interface that we're used to from lots of other things. We have our gutter icons, and when we click on those gutter icons, we get the pre-populated list of run configurations. We can control click or command click on different things to jump around just like every other IDE. And let's take a look at uh, doing some debugging. So I'm going to make a change. It's going to break things. New LHS hasn't actually been assigned the value of LHS, so big surprise, our unit test fails, and we get nice output in the uh, terminal window, of course. But I can't figure out what's wrong, so let's go ahead and create another profile for debug. It knows uh, default, uh, you know, debug is a sane thing to do next, so it auto-populated all of that. But we do need to go ahead and tell Conan to map our CMake debug profile to our Conan debug profile. So we do that, and now we can go back to the CMake pane and tell it to rerun CMake, where it will automatically rerun Conan again. Again, this ran instantaneously because I already have the, uh, the packages downloaded in my cache. But with that done, we can go ahead and uh, actually set a breakpoint and run this in the debugger. And we do have conditional breakpoints with the same interface, again, that you're used to from IntelliJ or something else. So here's a view of that memory table that I was talking about. We can see uh, new LHS and its values are all set to zeros right there. And we can, you know, go to some other variable and, you know, what's RHS defined as or set to. So we ask for the address of RHS and we get zero two. Again, Valgrind support is great. We can switch over to the Valgrind tab and we see that stack trace along with all of the frames and preview that jumps us right to the offending line.
Okay, so I talked about remote development. In this use case, I'm going to open up the same project. I've done a git clean, so it's empty. And instead of defining a local tool chain, I'm going to point it at my remote server. The server is stood up in AWS. It has a similar level of preparation as the Docker file in the previous couple demos. Uh, where I've installed the tools, I I can't remember if I actually set that Conan profile setting or not, but we'll see that in a moment. Uh, but it, it's basically just a bare bones Linux server with compiler and CMake and Conan pre-installed, and that's about it. I did already define uh, my remote, my SSH credentials in here. So when I select the tool chain from the drop down here, you'll see I just select remote. Um, I can show you guys that afterwards if you care. So we've defined a couple uh, tool chains here, one for release, one for debug, and we can see it's copying all of the files up to the server. Doesn't take too long. And of course, it did not uh, successfully run CMake because we do need to run Conan still. So I'll just copy that slash temp directory where it moved all of my files, SSH into that machine, and go ahead and run Conan. Of course, because this is downloading from Conan server onto an AWS server, the network is absurdly fast. I'm sorry, I just looked at the time. I didn't realize uh, how long this was taken. Okay, with that, we can start looking at the source code and you'll see it's all very seamless. Um, oh, we do need to run CMake. So let's go ahead and open up source file. We can see it has uh, almost finished downloading everything. All of the files have been downloaded locally. All of the uh, dependencies, you know, the source code for the dependencies was pulled off of that remote server and cached locally. So we get the same experience locally with the gutter icons, whatnot. We can control click into dependencies that as far as CLine is concerned, did not previously exist on my system before uh, this execution. And here we can see where it's downloaded them. So it went into my uh, C Lion cache directory into a folder named for this project. And then it's also reproducing the full absolute path from the remote server within here. So this lets us cache everything that's used on the remote server locally. And at that point, the development experience uh, will feel pretty much like it did before. And I'm going to skip the rest of this demo in the name of time. But suffice it to say, once you've gotten this far, it really just feels like you're developing locally, but everything gets offloaded to that remote server. We're just about at the end here. So I want to say every demo that I've shown here and all of the tools I've talked about uh, were the demos were created with a tool that I made named Jumpstart. It helps you scaffold out new C and C++ projects, asks you a bunch of uh, questions about your project, like not just its name, but whether or not you want C++ support, whether you want unit testing support, and then it'll scaffold out a new project in a sane folder structure with all of the tools that I've talked about. You can get started with that tool at those links and that command. Tools generated with Jumpstart will include support for running Clang Tidy as part of compilation, just automatically. Uh, I would like to include a Clang format Git hook at some point. I haven't done that yet. Uh, but it does include support for running Valgrind optionally, automatically, as part of executing unit tests. It'll generate code coverage reports for you. It'll execute, uh, it'll build your Doxygen documentation with a custom make target. 
and it will dynamically generate a SonarCube properties file for you so you don't have to try and synchronize your project name, your project version number, where your code coverage reports are. It pulls all of that information from CMake's own configuration and then writes a SonarCube properties file uh, at CMake configure time. Okay, so to summarize, we have dependency management taken care of by Conan. Your build system is CMake. Uh, I like a Google test and Google mock for testing and mocking, but you could certainly substitute your own tools in there. Your uh, GCOV or I think LCOV from LLVM work fantastic for code coverage. Clang Tidy does a fantastic job of uh, static code analysis and then Clang Format, of course, for your formatter. Valgrind comes to the rescue like it always has for dynamic code analysis. c is my favorite IDE, uh, so I, I recommend it. But I do want to emphasize again, you can use other IDEs with this full tool set. And of course, GDB or LLDB for your debugger. But you should really just be using Rust instead because it takes care of all of this and you wouldn't have even needed this presentation if you were doing Rust instead. So. Thank you. One o'clock on the dot. Uh, any questions?